Um, ladies and gentlemen, to this, the 15th milestone lecture. The milestone lectures were established in 2000 uh, to mark the college's 650th um, anniversary and have gone on ever since, drawing on a remarkable uh, array of college talent. And today we're going to be taken on a 13 and a half billion, sorry, I think I'm, I'm sorry, I need to speak to the microphone, I'm forgetting that. <laughs> Today we're going to be taken on a 13 and a half billion year tour in an hour, I understand. And in order to do that, we have not one but three college fellows to assist us. Professor Mike Hobson has been a fellow for many, many years, and many of you will know him. He's currently vice master, and he's a professor of astrophysics. Dr. Alexandra Turkin is fellow and director of studies in earth sciences and a university lecturer in earth sciences. And Dr. Rob Asher is a fellow and university senior lecturer in zoology. And a couple of years ago, he published a book called Evolution and Belief. Confessions of a Religious Paleontologist. Now, Professor Hobson is going to speak for 20 minutes or so on the origins of the universe. Dr. Turkin on the origins of life. And Dr. Asher on the origins of humanity. All in fulfillment of our title, Origins from Singularity to Sentience. So there'll be about an hour of input and then at the end of it, we'll have about half an hour for questions, and the panel will come up onto the stage. There'll be a roving microphone uh, if you want to ask questions. Uh, and if you'd like to ask a question, do please be aware that this is being filmed, and we will need to ask your permission, or rather you will need to be happy uh, to appear on the film in order to ask a question. I think that's all I need to say, except to point out again the obvious. Please switch off your mo mobile phones. Uh, I have to remind myself to do that as well, so um, me too. Thank you very much. Mike, over to you. Okay, thank you, Master. Right, so um, as the Master just said, I'm going to attempt to describe the origins of the universe in 20 minutes. Uh, I'm going to be doing the first nine billion of those 13 and a half billion years before I hand over to my colleague, uh, Sasha Turchin. So um, as one looks out into the night sky, you see this. If you were to map the whole night sky like you would say onto the surface of a globe, it's the whole thing. And looking out into the sky with your eyes that see in a visible, obviously, wavelengths, the sky is dominated by the stars in our own galaxy. Uh, and the sort of band of emission across the middle, which you can see from a, a nice dark site even in the UK, uh, which is the, 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 the disk of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. So that's what the night sky looks like, dominated by our own galaxy and the stars within it, particularly that Milky Band of emission. If one were to be able to step outside of our galaxy, um, you can perform observations from within our galaxy, and they're very hard to do, but after a while you can build a map of what the galaxy would look like if you looked at it from outside, and this is what it would look like, okay, if you looked at it, um, uh, uh, looking at it uh, from the top. So it's a, an edge-on, it's a spiral galaxy that is essentially flat. You look at it from the top and it has these lovely spiral structures in it. And if you were to locate, if this were our galaxy, obviously it isn't our galaxy, it's another one that looks like it, we can't go outside our own, um, then if you were to locate our sun, it would be about here. So our solar system sits inside a uh, spiral galaxy of this sort, and we are in the deeply unfashionable galactic suburbs, uh, where nothing really happens very much. We're on the inner part of one of the spiral arms. We're a long way away from the, the bright lights, and the, literally, and excitement of the galactic center. Now, if one tries a little harder and looks out more deeply into the universe, for example, using the Hubble Space Telescope, one begins to see things that aren't just the stars uh, and emission from our own galaxy, because, because our galaxy is one of billions. So the Hubble Space Telescope did lots of things, but one of the things it did was it just stared at a, what was thought at the time to be a blank patch of sky. And the reason I'm fumbling in my pocket is to find a, uh, a coin, 10p, so 50p, okay? So it picked a little patch of sky, 
And the size of the patch on the sky is if you hold a 10p piece at arm's length, the patch on the sky that it covers is about the area covered by the queen's eye. OK? Right? Tiny. There was nothing particularly there. It just stared. OK? And this is what it saw. Let me... Uh, does this is to orientate you as to where on the sky it is. I hope even those with rudimentary astronomical knowledge recognise that. <laughs> and so we're focusing in through a series, zooming in through a series of surveys, looking at uh, smaller and smaller regions, focusing down onto this queen eye size patch of the universe that was previously nothing special, just a blank field, but looked at very deeply. And this is what you see. And just let me blow that up for you. This is what you see in that patch. Myriad galaxies. This is a field star in our own galaxy. But all of these are spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies, galaxies of various types. And there are thousands of them in that patch, in that tiny patch. So that gives you an idea of the amount of structure in the universe. Each of these is a galaxy with 100 billion stars in, just like our own. So one can look even harder. And more recently, something called the 2DF survey, two-degree field survey, looked out of our galaxy. So this is our galaxy. This is the, where we are with the sun out in an unfashionable spiral arm. And it looked out in two fans, it looked out in two directions. And it mapped the positions of the galaxies uh, in, the, uh, in these fans and the distance. Okay? And what did it see? Well, it saw the large-scale distribution of the galaxies in the universe. And this is what it looks like. So it mapped the positions in these two fans and the distances, this is billions of light years, of around a quarter of a million galaxies. Okay? And so this is our best picture of the very largest scale of the universe that we understand, that we can see. And what you see here is that each of these dots is a galaxy. You see that there are concentrations of galaxies which come together to form clusters of galaxies. But there are those clusters of galaxies themselves are arranged along walls, and there are large voids in the distribution as well. And when I'm describing this to students, I think the best analogy I can have is those of you who, I don't know many of you would use one of these, but a bathroom loofah sponge, if you slice through it, it's about that sort of structure. Okay? That's the, the, uh, that is the large-scale structure of our universe. Each dot is a galaxy. Now, what is, uh, let me just give you some numbers associated with, with these uh, these. So our galaxy, a typical galaxy, is roughly 100,000 light years across. So it would take light 100,000 years to cross it. And it has roughly 100 billion stars in it. Clusters of galaxies, where galaxies group together, might typically contain hundreds or thousands of galaxies. And they're around 10 million light years across. They themselves are hierarchically clustered into what's often termed superclusters with, again, hundreds, maybe even thousands of clusters. And they're around 500 million, half a billion light years across. And in the entire observable universe, as far out as we can see, I'll explain that for you in a moment, there are around 100 billion galaxies. So there are around as many galaxies in the universe that we can observe as there are stars in a single galaxy. And you're talking about the typical size of the observable universe at around 15 billion light years. So, the content of the universe is staggeringly complex and very, very grand in scale, as you can appreciate. Very big. What's most amazing, however, is that all of that structure isn't just sitting there. If you look again more carefully, you observe something astonishing. So hopefully you're all familiar with the idea of <coughs> Doppler shift. So if an ambulance goes past you, you will hear its siren uh, moving up in frequency, and as it passes you, it'll move down in frequency. Okay? And that's because, basically, the waves are bunching up in front of the, of the horn and stretching out behind it. And the same thing happens with light. So if you measure the light from a galaxy, distant galaxy or a star or whatever, all of that structure I showed you is made of the same stuff that we understand here on Earth. And so it's made of the atoms that we're familiar with and some other stuff. Um, and you can use those atoms as a sort of cosmic barcode and simultaneously as a cosmic radar gun. So the barcode says, I recognize this barcode. This is a particular atom that I understand. And I know where 
I know where the spectral lines, this is all to do with um, uh, electrons in the atom jumping between energy levels, the details aren't important. The point is that as you look further and further away in the universe, these characteristic barcodes that these atoms have shift. And what that's telling you is that as you move away in the universe, the further you move away, things are moving apart. Moreover, it happens linearly. So the further, if each of these dots is a galaxy, the further away it is, the faster it's moving. So every galaxy in the universe is moving away, on average, from every other one at a rate that's proportional to the distance between them. And this was discovered by Edwin Hubble in the 1920s. And so that's a profound observation. So all that structure I showed you is moving. And so the combination of Hubble's law and that sort of large-scale isotropy looks the same in every direction you look in the sky. There's no special direction. That tells you something profound. It tells you that the universe is expanding in all directions. OK. Like any gas, as it expands, it cools. So let's imagine what happens when we wind time backwards. If we wind time backwards, the universe must get denser and hotter and smaller. And as you wind time backwards, you get um, to increasingly smaller time. So here we are. Now, this is the timeline of our universe. Here we are now, the modern universe. Our best cosmological theorists suggest that the time since this point, which I'll come to in a second, is about 13 and a half billion years, as the master said earlier. But the universe is not a constant. It's, it's growing, as we saw, and it's expanded, and it's evolved like everything in the universe. The universe itself evolves. So all the structure that we see today hasn't been there forever. It's had to form. And so as you go back in time, earlier and earlier times, these are tens of billions of years, billion years, a few hundred thousand years, seconds, microseconds, etc. The temperatures get hotter and hotter and hotter. And so the universe really, as you look back, tests our understanding of physics in more and more extreme scenarios. So we wind the universe back. We can calculate, as we wind it back at a particular age, how hot it is. You can do that calculation. And then you can figure out what sort of physics is dominating at that time. And you can wind it back, say, to this point, 300,000 years. That's the point at which the universe, the universe going this way first becomes opaque. That first becomes transparent. So going this way, the universe is opaque earlier than this, to do with scattering of, of, of um, electrons. And so we can only see in the universe, as you look out into the universe, because light travels at a finite speed, you're looking backwards in time. So as you look out into the universe, there's a limit as how far you can see. And it's basically you're looking back to the surface that where light scattered just 300,000 years after the Big Bang. We're at several billion years. As you push further, you, you understand how nucle nuclei form. Further back, you have um, uh, subatomic particles of various sorts forming. And we kind of have the physics from colliders like the Large Hadron Collider. We kind of have the physics to understand things back to fractions of a microsecond. We know roughly the physics that operates there. However, of course, everyone's <laughs> most interested in this bit, which is the true origin of this talk. We don't know what that is. But we have a good idea of what might happen very, very closely back to it. Closest 10 to the minus 34 seconds. That's naught point and then 33 zeros and a 1. Okay? This goes way beyond the physics that you can get out of colliders. But the reason we feel confident is that when we postulate what happens here, and then we wind time forwards, we seem to be able to create a universe that looks like the one we see today. So let me explain that in more detail. Going back, firstly, right to here. Let's, let's try and understand what's going on as the universe gets hotter and hotter, going back to that initial singularity point. What happens is that there are four known forces in nature. There's forces of electromagnetism, there's the force of gravity, and there are two other forces that only operate on nuclear scales in the nucleus, the strong and weak nuclear force, and they're separate today. But what happens is, as you go back further and further in the universe, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, they actually combine. So what we see today as separate forces are manifestations of a single force that operated at very high temperatures. What's happening here is essentially the universe is going through a phase transition. 
in the same way as the, in the same way as if you take steam and cool it, you get water. You get water and cool it, you get ice. They're different forms of the same thing. And this is basically what's happening in the early universe. And you build models of how this might happen. They have fantastic titles like Grand Unified Theories. And these are sorts of things that Hawking is working on, trying to figure out how gravity fits in with all of this. Very complicated subject, but there's one thing to take away, which is this whole process works by having a certain type of particle in it. And it's a particle called a scalar field particle. And the Higgs boson, which you'll have heard a lot about recently, is an example of it. So we now, in the last year or so, have direct evidence that these sorts of particles exist. And the amazing thing is that particles like this behave in a very strange way. Rather, they make the universe behave in an astonishingly bizarre fashion very early on in its history, at this point when all of the forces are combining into a single force. Those scalar fields act like a fluid with a negative pressure. Don't worry about the details. What it means is that a universe filled with one of those rapidly expands. And by rapid, I mean in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it expands in size by a billion, 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 billion times. Sounds astonishing, right? Can't be true. However, this model really does explain why the universe looks the way it does. It stretches the universe enormously. And so it explains why the universe is so homogeneous and isotropic on all scales. Because what we see as the universe was once a little patch that's been stretched out. But beyond that, it actually says something very profound about the nature of everything that we see in the universe. Because we're stretching things so much that at the very smallest subatomic scales, quantum theory operates. Quantum theory is the theory of um, elementary particles. They can pop in and out of existence in something called the vacuum. And you can have fluctuations. At the quantum level, the universe is never still and calm. It's always bubbling away. You don't usually see that except in very precise experiments because it's happening at subatomic scales. But if it's happening in the very early universe, and then this inflation happens, and you whack it apart by 50 orders of magnitudes in size, those microscopic things that we can observe in the laboratory doing it carefully now become macroscopic. They become the size of you and me and stars and galaxies and clusters. So the basic idea is simple. Inflation plus quantum mechanics has to lead to fluctuations, perturbations in the density of the universe. So the idea is that you have quantum fluctuations, excuse my cartoon of quantum fluctuations, which through inflation lead you to a um, lead you to very, very tiny perturbations that we can observe in, remember I said. The, the, the longest we can go back to observe a recombination, it's called the cosmic microwave background. You can observe over the whole sky fluctuations in the temperature of that background of one part in a million or so. And you can map them out, and this is actually part of what I do. But these fluctuations are quantum fluctuations that have been expanded by this inflationary epoch. Then, these fluctuations, what do they do? Well, they will collapse under gravity. If you have a fluctuation, which means that this bit of the universe is slightly denser than this bit, then this bit of the universe will attract matter at the cost of this bit of the universe. So if you have a perturbation and you have gravity, the perturbations grow. They get bigger and bigger. They just pull in more and more matter. It runs away. It's an instability. And so what happens is that through gravitational collapse, you begin to form structure. And that structure is what we see in the universe today. So this really is the nub of it. And I'll just, in the rest of the talk, explain precisely how this happens. But the nub of it is the smallest scales one can imagine, plus inflation in the early universe, means that everything we see, all of that structure, the clusters, the voids, the galaxies, the stars, the planets, and you, are ultimately the result of the expansion of quantum fluctuations in the earliest stages of the universe. And that's something we've only really understood in the last 10 years or so. So let me just explain a little bit about how these structures form to give you what I, what I showed earlier. Well, 
Here's a simulation of a box of the universe, 200, about 600 uh, million light years across. And those perturbations that I put in are just collapsing under gravity. And where there was structure, more and more structure is forming. And so you have this characteristic um, concentration of matter with filaments between it and voids, which we saw when we looked out at the universe. This is a physical simulation of the process of structure formation on the very largest scales in the universe. Here is, just look at it in 2D rather than 3D. It's another example of it happening. So this is about, a, about 150 million light years. Here we're coming to the present day from the early universe, and we're just letting all of those perturbations that quantum mechanics laid down in the early stages of, of the universe's history, and we're letting them evolve under gravity. And where there was a density contrast to begin with, it pulls and pulls more matter. It runs away with itself. And so you see this characteristic structure. You see all of the matter falling into nodes. And these nodes are clusters of galaxies. And those nodes lie at the intersections of filaments. And those filaments themselves begin to fragment. So let's just see the universe on its largest scale. This now is a simulation of this process where the whole box here is about, uh, is, is about nearly 15 billion light years across. And this is the structure that you get at the end of that process. And you can home in and see what's, what's there. Let's do that. Let's go closer and closer in to this and zoom in. So we're, we're zooming into a patch. The patch I just showed you forming was probably about this size. And as we zoom into it, you see you have these filamentary structures. At the crossing points of them, you have matter that's fallen in to these nodes. And this is where you get clusters of galaxies forming. But these filaments themselves have begun to fragment like beads on a string. And there are also clusters of galaxies all the way along here. And you have vast voids, hundreds of millions of light years across. So we're focusing in now on a particular cluster of galaxies at this node point between these filaments. If I had, let's look how a particular cluster of galaxies forms. This is now that last size box forming a cluster of Galaxies, yes, here we go. Yes. So again, you're seeing the filaments. So this is coming out with the light not so well. But you're, you're, you're seeing the filaments here. And the matter is collapsing. It's, the gravity of each particle is pulling all the others towards it. And you're forming. Each of these dots is a galaxy. And they're combining to form a large cluster of galaxies. All of these galaxies are part of a vast cluster of galaxies, right? Um, hundreds of millions of light years across. And this is forming a typical uh, relaxed galactic uh, uh, cluster structure. And if you actually look at what a real one looks like, that's the simulation, and a real one looks like this. Okay? We can begin to predict why the universe looks the way it does. But the galaxies, the clusters themselves, are formed from, um, have, have galaxies okay, in them. So here and now, here we're zooming in now on these filaments, and these are individual galaxies. And we can see how these evolve as the universe, uh, as the universe uh, gets older and older and older. So the individual galaxies have condensed out, and there are lots of them, and they begin to interact with one another. And you can see this one is starting to form a spiral structure, exactly like we see in the real universe. This is a spiral structure of this galaxy. Um, it's edge on, it's flat, just like our own. Let's pick another one, take a look at that. These galaxies are constantly evolving. We're now 8 billion years after Big Bang, 9 billion years. And they interact with one another. So you might get a stable structure for a while, a galaxy like ours, which is a stable spiral. Then it might interact with another galaxy and another one. And you look out into the universe and you see these interactions. You see all of this structure. But the main point is that our understanding of physics predicts the shapes that we see in the real universe. These are galaxies forming. This is the process, vastly accelerated, of how galaxies form. So if we have a single galaxy, what happens with that? So here's a single galaxy. As it evolves, again, just letting the equations of gravity do their thing, you see it starts fragmenting. And all of these little blobs you see here are little clumps of gas that are fragmented out of the disk of the galaxy. And each one, remember our, our, our galaxy looks a bit like this and we're out at an edge. Our star, the sun, would have formed in one of these little clumps of gas. 
And you can even zoom in now even closer. Let's look how one of these clumps of gas forms a star. So we come down right to the star level now. This is one of those clumps of gas in our galaxy. Let's see what gravity does to it when we let it evolve. Again, you see the same things happening, but now on much smaller scales. This is just tens of thousands of AU, and AU is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So it's on much tinier scales now. But here we see the same thing, and initially, initially uh, very close to uniform distribution starts to collapse under its own gravity. It forms these filamentary structures. Where those filaments cross, you get matter draining in to centers where it's very, very dense, and you start forming dense objects. So let's focus in on this dense object here. And you see now, bang, it starts forming stars. That's how stars are formed, by the collapse of dense little cores of gas in our galaxy. And as these stars form, they're slingshotted out into the general galactic distribution, and you created a large number of stars, all being formed from this collapsing core, being constantly fed with more material. And you can see here that these individual stars are starting to form little disks around them. In exactly the same way as you saw the formation of disks at the galactic scale, at the stellar scale, you're seeing the formation of disks. And that's absolutely crucial, of course, because, oops, sorry, because as a single star forms, it's just a blow up of that single star forming, it collapses into a disk. This jet switches on, which I haven't got time to describe. And as, it, as the star forms, condenses out at the center, you have a flat disk forming, and that disk itself then itself breaks up until you start forming planets. And these planets form, gradually accreting matter as they move round and round the star. And so you've now got down to the level of a single solar system forming, all just by letting gravity do its thing. And as the star begins to do nuclear burning, it blows away all the gas and dust that was there to start with, from which it formed, and you end up with a clean solar system. So, what about our solar system? Well, our solar system is a little bit different in that here's a simulation looking top down on a solar system. You'll see the planets start to form. And this is a bit like ours, right? So these are planets forming out of instabilities in the disk. This is the star, these are the planets. And the point is, it's a chaotic system. And occasionally, planets will intersect with one another. In other words, you'll see at the end of this movie, these planets look like they're in nice, stable orbits, doing their thing, quietly getting on with uh, not bothering anybody, then all of a sudden you will see that just by the way, by chance, these things almost hit there, a very near miss, and now, in a second, bang, collision. And that's what happened in our solar system, right? And that's important, because in our solar system, you're building up these planets from the disk, you're building up these planets as smaller <coughs> lumps of matter bang into one another, and gradually you form, these, form the Earth, OK? But there was another planet called Thea, it is named, uh, that you have the Earth here cooling. It's being bombarded by meteorites and the like. And you can see massive seismic activity as the, as the, as the planet cools. And so it was a very different place to what you might imagine the, the planet looks like now, not, not hospitable in any way. And although it's beginning to cool down for Earth, this wasn't the end of the story. What happens is that there's another planet orbiting which we think hit Earth. Okay? And as this planet strikes the Earth, what happens is this poor thing's just started to cool down and it's completely, well, not destroyed, but the whole system is perturbed. And then what happens is that the matter that is uh, the, these two planets, instead of breaking apart into two equal sized planets, most of the matter ends up in one object, which is the Earth, and the other sort of tidal tail of material swinging around the Earth gradually gets accreted up into another object. And that object is our moon. And that moon is crucial for stabilizing the orbit of our Earth. If the moon wasn't there, the, state, the, 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 the rotation axis of our Earth, the rotation of the Earth, wouldn't be nearly so stable. And so this forming of the Earth and a single moon system 
made for a very stable environment in which, with a bit of luck, as Sasha's going to explain to us, life can form. <laughs>